Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me now. Thank you so much for being here on a Saturday. I have to apologize. I have a bit of a cold, so hopefully it won't be too annoying to hear my voice. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Um, this is our second conversation on Buddha Nature event in the new year. Unfortunately, already there's been so much sad news. I hope this event will be a bright part of the day. <laughs> Uh, you can see all the past events on the Buddha Nature resource website. They're now available both as video and audio recordings that you can download and play anytime. So please feel free to um, send questions with the Q&A function on Zoom. Or if you're live on Facebook, just use the comments there. I'll take a look. Uh, we'll have time set aside for questions at the end. So Conversations on Buddha Nature is a series of online interviews with Buddhist practitioners, scholars, and thinkers on the topic of Buddha Nature. For this event, Lopen Dr. Karma Punso will speak with the master translator and Buddhist teacher, Dr. Carl Brunhodel. So we're honored to have Mitra Carl with us here today. I studied with Carl at Natarta Institute, where he has translated, taught, and developed much of the curriculum for over 20 years. Carl is one of the most prolific translators of Tibetan texts into English and has worked on all of the five treatises of Maitreya and has published more than 20 books now, I think, many of which are extensive and have many different Tibetan texts translated in each one. Uh, we actually have an ongoing tally at Sadra Foundation's research department. And currently of all books on Buddhism we have in our library, Carl holds the record for the most footnotes as well as the longest footnote. <laughs> But not all of his books are scholarly in nature. Actually, much of his work is focused on practice and practical instruction. He was originally trained as a physician and then studied at Kamala Shila Institute, Kempel Tsotram Gyamso's Marpa Institute, and Hamburg University. And since 1989, Carl has served as a translator, interpreter, and Buddhist teacher mainly in Europe, India, and Nepal. Carl's current projects include translating the largest compendium of the foundational texts of Mahamudra compiled by the seventh Karmapa called Sounds of Innate Freedom, the Indian text of Mahamudra, which is coming out in installments from Wisdom Publications. So Carl's book, When the Clouds Part, the Uttara Tantra and its meditative tradition as a bridge between Sutra and Tantra was the foundation of our Buddha Nature resource website. And he was one of the first people that we interviewed for this project. So once again, thank you so much for being here with us today. As you all know, Lopen Dr. Karma Punso is the recipient of Sadr Foundation's Writer in Digital Residence Grant for Buddha Nature Studies and is our host for these conversations on Buddha Nature. Karma Punso is one of Bhutan's leading intellectuals and completed both monastic training in the Tibetan traditions as well as a doctorate at Oxford. He is the founder of the Loden Foundation in Bhutan and his work is well known across the Himalayas and in Buddhist studies circles around the world. So without Further ado, please welcome Karl Brunhosel joining us from Munich, Germany, and Karma Punso joining us from Bhutan. Thank you. Thank Marcus. you, Marcus. <clears throat> and hello, Tashidele Kuzu Zangpo. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And uh, welcome, uh, Karl. A really great honor to have you with us. You have been with us. Uh, during the launch of this event, and it's nice to see you again. Uh, before we start the session, let's uh, give a few moments to cultivate the right intention and make uh, prayers and wishes that this benefit all sentient beings, especially as we are gripped with news of aggression in Ukraine and many other parts of the world. Let's hope that this message of Buddha nature combining wisdom and compassion reaches more hearts. Well, thank you. And Carl, uh, once again, uh, it's a great honor for us to have you. And I hope my internet connection will uh, um, stay stable. It's uh, been quite erratic these days and uh, there has also been power cuts. So 
I hope I'll be able to uh, stay with you until the end of the conversation. Um, yes. <clears throat> now you, you have been such a um, great authority on Buddha nature, uh, especially in English. Uh, and uh, as I've been working on Buddha nature for Zatra Foundation, I've discovered that you have done so much. Uh, at one point I was thinking of uh, collating and compiling the commentaries on the crucial verses uh, from the ultimate continuum by my trip. Yeah. And I discovered you have already done that. <laughs> and I was also thinking about some um, sort of uh, precursors to the Shintongpa thought in Tibet. And I discovered you have again done that. <laughs> so I, I've been discovering quite a lot of wonderful work that you have done. Um, and it's really wonderful to have you in this forum again. And through this forum, as you know, we are trying to um, create a space for people to share experiences and insights into uh, Buddha nature. Uh, for beginners, we hope that we can promote this message of Buddha nature and through this uh, ethos of positive thinking um, of um, the innate goodness of uh, all beings. And then for more advanced students and practitioners, hope that this sharing of experiences and insights can deepen their understanding of the nature and their familiarity with it. So uh, wonderful to have you, uh, given your long sort of experience in studying, researching, teaching topics related to the nature. I often ask my guests the first question of when and how did you encounter the teachings on the nature and what you thought about it? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Kamala. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here as well. And, um, you know, there's so many people now who are working on Buddha nature teachings. Um, so, you know, it's great to see that. Um, I'm sure the one who is behind all that is nobody else but Buddha nature, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the flourishing of the teachings. So that's great. and. I make the aspiration that whatever goodness comes from this session that we're having today will be hopefully a small cause for stopping the aggression in in the world and in particular in the Ukraine. So to your question, um, I think first my first encounter with Buddha nature, you know, in terms of teaching was a little bit in disguise, which is fitting for Buddha nature and ordinary sentient beings because it was in through Shambhala training. Um, and in its very, very early days in 1983 and 1984 in Marburg in Germany. So there was just under development, the Shambhala training. Of course, now it's a big thing. So at that point, there were five training levels. And uh, so I went through them and it was a weekend and they talked about basic goodness, which if one knows Trungpa Rinpoche's teachings, that is his non-Buddhist term for Buddha nature, basically. So that was what I ex was exposed to first. And it was very nice um, because it was, um, the teachers were very good. They were very heartfelt like they really put themselves out there. So it was really like a, you know, embodiment, open heart of Buddha nature. So that left uh, quite an impression in me. And then of course, later I encountered the more uh, formal teachings, Buddhist teachings, first in the Jugal Ornament, uh, and then in the Uttara Tantra. Um, so yeah, but that was the, that was like, yeah, hitting the heart. That was the first thing. Uh, what did you receive those teachings, uh, initial teachings on uh, Uttara Tantra, the ultimate continuum from? Um, the Uttara Tantra was actually um, in Kamala Shila Institute in the course of a five year training in Buddhist studies uh, from a Kaji Kempo and so he was living in France at the time. He is no longer alive. So that was, yeah, that was that. 
And uh, you have um, now produced um, your uh, magnum opus, uh, is such a wonderful work, uh, Locus Classicus, I think, for studying the Uttara Tantra or the ultimate continuum in English, uh, When Clouds Part, the Uttara Tantra and its meditative tradition as a bridge between Sutra and Tantra. Um, what inspired you to write this volume? It's such a um, sort of large work, impressive, uh, covering quite a lot of detail. Yeah, I mean, most people won't believe that, but the original scope of the book was actually very modest. Like, basically just translated the Uttara Tantra, the commentary that Tibetan tradition ascribes to a Sangha, Ratnagota Vibhaga Vyakya, and then one Tibetan commentary by Tashi Ösa. And so, and mainly why I wanted to do that is because I thought the available index translations of the Uttara Tantra and his commentary were a little bit outdated, like Obar Miller had done one in Takasaki. And of course, they were great pioneers, but I felt I would take my own step at it. But then when I started working on this, then more and more things kept popping up. And that's how the book mushroomed into its present form. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, Sean Price from Tsarja Foundation, actually, he alerted me at some point. He said, did you know there's a commentary by Marpa Lotsava on the Uttara Tantra? And I said, no, mm -hmm. I had no idea. No, I never heard about that. And then, so he sent me photocopies of that. And then I think that's one of your other questions for later, who that commentary is by. Anyway, that popped up and then a lot of texts in the Kadampa tradition, mostly by Mönlam, uh, Gyotan Mönlam Tsurtim, that also are like more um, experiential instructions on the Uttara Tantra. <clears throat> Those came up and then I did take another look at the eight Kamapas lamp, lamp of Shantong and also Tang Tungtul's guiding instructions. And I was also interested in the connection between um, Mahamudra and the uh, Uttara Tantra. And then also the meditative tradition of the Maitreya texts. I, I heard that word many times, but I never had really any idea, okay, what is that exactly? And are there, is there any sources? So I know that, and then also there was some interest in the sutra sources of Buddha nature. So all of that then came together. So it was yeah. much bigger than originally intended. And your uh, subtitle of this uh, book um, explicitly mentions how the Uttara Tantra or Radna Gotra Vibhaga, the ultimate continuum, is a bridge between Sutra and Tantra. And that's often been said about this particular text, although we know it is a uh, a clearly a sort of a sutra based shastra, a sutra based uh, treatise. Uh, in what ways uh, would you argue is this a bridge between sutra and tantra? Um, and where does this idea come from? Well, I'm not sure who brought it up first, but I know that it is definitely verbalized as such in the Kamakaji curriculum of the so called eight great texts five of which are considered the more or less classical sutra texts that pretty much everybody studies, like, you know, Pramana Vartika and commentaries and Abhisamaya Lankara and Madhyama Kavatara and <clears throat> the Vinaya and so on. And, um, but the, then there's three additional texts which are classified as Tantra. And the first one of those is the Uttara Tantra. And that is actually, explicitly said that this is the bridge between Sutra and Tantra. And then the other two is the profound inner topics by the third Kamapa and the Hevata Tantra. So those are considered to be in one group in addition to the classical Sutra uh, topics. And then I would say that the Uttara Tantra provides the basic view of Buddha nature. It doesn't really talk about practice, obviously, like really not at all. Um, but it is definitely the, in, in the Kamakaji tradition, it is said to be the view, the basic view of all Tantras. 
uh, because all the tantras speak about a disclosure model of the nature of the mind, Buddha nature, however you want to call it, but they're not necessarily giving a systematic presentation of Buddha nature in the way that the Uttara Tantra does, mm -hmm. but they're kind of presupposing that kind of understanding. So you could say the Uttara Tantra is the view that's also present in the Tantras, whereas then the Tantras are the actually, how do you practice with that view? Like how do you uh, mm -hmm. directly work with Buddha nature? Because the, the Vajrayana obviously is it's also called the resultant vehicle, right? Resultant jhana, as opposed mm -hmm. to the causal uh, one. So what is the resultant? And that's also clearly outlined in the Uttara Tantra, that basically the, the ground or the fourth Vajra point, which is the Datu, Buddha nature itself, is really not different from the fruition. So what you're working mm -hmm. with in the Vajrayana is exactly that and so um otherwise i think you could not call the vajrayana resultant yana because if you understand buddha nature mm. is just a seed or a potential that's not the fruition nobody says that right so if vajrayana would work only with seed mm. or potential then it would still be causal yana so i think that's a important point that when you talk about resultant yana what, what does that mean it really means you you try to work with the fruition as much as possible and that's only possible in terms of buddha nature mm -hmm. since the cause and the result are not different so in that way then you could say <coughs> the, so the, is the bridge mm. So, uh, in considering the Uttara Tantra as a bridge between Sutra and Tantra, we are basically implying that Buddha nature is identical with the resultant state of the Buddhahood. <laughs> well, that's what it says, is my understanding in the Uttara Tantra, very clearly. Like it talks about suchness with stains and it talks about suchness without stains, right? Fourth Vajra point is with stains. Fifth Vajra point and all after that is without stains, but the suchness is the same. But of course, I know there's many debates on that and different opinions. Yes, indeed, yes. Uh, but I was also wondering um, if, uh, in addition to the actual topics covered by the text, even the title itself, unlike all the other sutra treatises, not having an explicit term tantra as part of the title. If mm -hmm. this has also led to people think that this is already sort of a step moving away from Sutra towards a Tantra realm. <laughs> yes, definitely, because some people actually do interpret the word Tantra and Uttara Tantra as referring to the, the causal Tantra, the method Tantra and the fruitional Tantra. But that's not everybody. Some people do mm -hmm. that. So they explicitly link it to, the, mm -hmm. to that kind of uh, language which is exclusive to the Vajrayana. So, yeah, clearly that is there. Though the text itself explains it differently. And then um, when you talk about the Buddha nature teachings in the Kaju tradition, uh, which is our focus today, um, in general Tibetan scholarship or in general Tibetan sort of historical transmissions, you have the scholarly transmission through Mokulotsawa and his followers, and then the meditative transmission through uh, Ten Kaoche and his followers. Um, but in addition to these two, would you say that the Kajupas actually received also a transmission uh, via Maitripa and Marpa directly? So not necessarily channeled through Sajana in Kashmir and through Kashmir? Well, that is possible, but I haven't seen any explicit record of such a distinct separate tradition. And it seems, I mean, it could, could of course be that, you know, the whole thing went just orally and was kept secret. That is very much possible. Mm -hmm. But it seems that Marpa clearly was focused on, on Tantras and Vajrayana. Like, from all we know, it didn't do really much sutra studies, if any. And mm -hmm. 
also um, the early Kaji masters mostly were yogis and mostly oriented in that. Gampopa was one sort of one exception in his early life and he studied with the Kadampa and I think that's probably where the early Kaji masters got their sutra studies. I mean, in the case of Gampopa, it's very clear, but also the other early Kaji figures like the first Kamapa and also the early other Kamapas and others, they all have studied with Kadampas or Sakyas. Mm -hmm. And so since we now know that there is this transmission of the Uttara Tantra meditative tradition actually in the Kadampa school, not necessarily as its mainstream body, but it's there and the texts are still there, then I think that is probably where they received the transmission of both Noglotsava's tradition, which was also continued in the Kadampa, and Zen Kavoche's, and there may have been others, but Zen Kavoche's lineage is getting a little bit vague after a time in Tibet. And uh, yeah, so I, I think they got both from, from Moli, mostly that direction. Uh, but uh, mm. there's no clear lineage histories about that, like the five treatises transmission and the early Kaji lineage. It's more of starting mm. with the third Kamapa then, who studied mm. with the abbot of Sangpu, and that's where he got his trainings in the five uh, Maitreya texts in particular. Mm. Yeah. And, but, and uh, I would like Kong to and... come to. Mm. Sorry. Maybe Sorry, that's please. a little bit ahead, but like when you look at Jamming Kongtrul, he received his transmission from the ninth C2 Rinpoche and he from the 13th Kamapa and then um, the eighth C2 Rinpoche and he got it from uh, Kato Tsewang Morbu, who they were close mm -hmm. friends, ninth C2 Rinpoche and Kato Tsewang Norbu. So that was coming actually from the Nyingma tradition and it is said that Kato Tsewang Norbu um, told the Etsy Dubai he should uphold the Shantong view. And so before that, Termin Kongtru uh, lists a whole, mainly the transmission through the Jonang lineage. So that seems to be his main, and he also is his main support is uh, Jonang Taranata. So of course, Buddha nature teachings are, they are very strong. Mm. Yeah, I think. Now, especially in the later uh, chapters of Buddha nature teachings, um, we seem to have transmissions from so many different sources. I think uh, when we talk about the two main lineages coming from uh, Kashmir, we are mostly talking about the lineage of the Uttara Tantra uh, teachings and not so much all Buddha nature, isn't it? Because later, I mean, when we have Kala Chakra come to Tibet, then there's a lot of Buddha nature teachings or teachings on luminosity coming through Kala Chakra. And I think Marpa would have received quite a lot of teachings on um, luminosity and uh, Buddha nature related topics from Naropa um, and so forth. But uh, to uh, go back to, the, uh, to something that you mentioned earlier, now that you said uh, John Price mentioned about a commentary by Marpa Lotsawa, which uh, stimulated you to work further and expand your book. Um, and then you have uh, basically concluded that this commentary is not by Marpa Chiki Lodre, the founding figure of Marpa Gaji, but rather Marpa Dopa Chiki Wangshuk. Can you tell us a bit more on how you reached this uh, conclusion? Yeah, it, it seems that the commentary is actually by a student probably of Marpa Dopa Chiki Wangshuk because it says in the colophon that it is based on the teachings by Marpa Dopa uh, mm. and also the teachings of uh, the Indian scholar Parahita Bhadra, who also lived in Kashmir. So he was in the same circle or uh, like Sajana, uh, who taught Ngoglotsava and also Tsen Kavoche. And so the first thing that of course I noticed was when I heard about this commentary, being by Marpa Lutsawa, the famous Marpa Lutsawa, because Marpa Dopa was also Lutsawa. And funnily, the two actually met, according to Blue Annals, mm -hmm. on the way to uh, Tibet, uh, to India and Tibet, crossing each other's paths. And so, but 
I had never heard of anybody say in the Kadri tradition that there was a commentary on the Uttara Tantra by Marpa Lutzava. And still, mm -hmm. nobody says that. So if there had been such a commentary, or even like, you know, the assumption that would have been definitely a big enough thing to make a big deal out of it. But there is no such thing. And then there's also, since the colophon of the commentary clearly says that it is based on Parahita Bhadra's teaching, then Ma, there's no evidence that Mapa Chikilodri was in Kashmir or had any contact with mm. Parahita Bhadra or Sajana at all. Like actually he was mostly in East India. And so these are the explicit sources in the commentary that I mentioned in the colophon. And then the other thing is that, of course, Marpa's dates are still not definitely settled, but if you take about something like, you know, 1012 to 1097, which a lot of people seem to agree on, then Ngoklo Saba was 1059 to 1109, which means quite a bit later. But the commentary refers to Ngoklo Saba's translation, actually, so which means it was made later than Ngoglot Sawa's translation. So it would have been very, very difficult in terms of just uh, timing mm -hmm. for Marpa Chikilodre to have written that because either he was already dead when Ngoglot Sawa made his translation or of very old age in Tibet somewhere. So that that's another uh, thing. And then we look at Marpa Lutzawa's translations. They're pretty much all tantric. There is no Mm. based translation so given all that and that there is a clear uh, historical connection between Parahita Bhadra and Marpa Dopa then it seemed pretty clear to me that it's not by Marpa Chikilodri and Marpa Dopa is an interesting figure because he was actually quite a major translator he translated a lot of Chakasambara related text and taught those in Tibet widely. And he had met Naropa also, like the other Marpa, and studied with all the Indian students of Naropa. So he shares basically the mm -hmm. same background in terms of transmission. Okay. Well, um, I found this uh, commentary in the collections of. Uh, Marpa Chukilote. So <laughs> in fact, yes. some people still think that it is by Marpa. <laughs> um, now, coming to the main um, um, sort of exponent, let's say the first main exponent of Buddha nature uh, theories uh, from the Karmakaju tradition would be third Karmapa you, who you brought up earlier. Um, a lot of people think that Thar Karmapa is a Shentongpa, now somebody who argued for the other emptiness, Buddha nature mm -hmm. being empty of efficacious stains and not being empty of itself. But then Karmapa Rangjung Dorji also actually um, expounded something um, which combines both emptiness and luminosity, isn't it? He, he didn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, espouse the same kind of Shentong as Dolpopa, for instance. So can you shed more light on that? Uh, you have done a lot of work on Rangjung Doji. Yeah, I think it's pretty striking that, I mean, first of all, the word Shentong appears in no writing of Rangjung Doji that we know of. Uh, and there is this story about that he met Dolpopa and so on and so forth. And uh, so of course, you can classify the third Kamapa as Shantong if you want, but it has to be clear that there's many different types of Shantong. So if you classify a third Kamapa, as you say, as Shantong, mm -hmm. it should be very clear that he's not saying the same things as Del Popa. Um, so, but he clearly also subscribes to the disclosure model of Buddha nature, which means the qualities are there, they just need to be revealed. There's no actual new development of previously not existing qualities. And he also says clearly that Buddha nature is not just mere emptiness. But in his presentation, he very skillfully combines actually the teachings on Buddha nature, Yogacara and Madhyamika. Also in terms of his quotes and mm. the whole way he presents it. So he also says Buddha nature is basically non-dual, non-conceptual wisdom, 
which is free of adventitious stains, which is of course a classical Shantung presentation. He also says it's natural luminosity, all these things, not empty of its own wisdom nature. But then also he says very clearly that this cannot be pinpointed as being empty, not being empty, both or neither, which is very classical Madhyamika. And so one of the crucial things he also says that has become a hallmark of Kaji also in Mahamudra is, is the difference between samsara and nirvana is whether the nature of the mind, meaning Buddha nature, is realized or not. In other words, is recognized for what it is or not, which then was later attacked by Adel Popa. Um, but then he also, that Kamapa also goes, subscribes to the Yogacara model of the eight consciousnesses, then becoming the four wisdoms of a Buddha and all that. Uh, and he says that in the final picture, all the great Indian masters, whether the Yogacara or Madhyamika, they agree on this point as the correct view of all the yanas. So in Kamakaji, at least third Kamapa is definitely seen as the ultimate authority on Buddha nature. And I think pretty much everybody after him more or less followed this. Like third Kamapa hasn't spelled mm -hmm. out maybe all the details that then somebody like the eighth Kamapa or Chamin Kongtrul did later, but he definitely gave the general picture. Mm. So you could say, if you want to um, call him Shantong, are... then it's a very balanced mm. form of Shantong. Like, as some people call it, non-exclusivist Shantong. Mm. Mm. Non-absolutist, can you say that as well? Because he proposes a union of emptiness and luminosity to describe yes. Buddha nature, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it's all mm. to that point that, you know, Yes, the qualities of Buddha nature are there, but if there's even the slightest iota of reification or clinging or solidification, then that's not it. So mm -hmm. that element is very clear. And, um, so <clears throat> then we find the eighth Karmapa um, also discussing Buddha nature um, and theorizing Buddha nature, but in between, uh, who would be some of the most important Karmakaji uh, proponents of Buddha nature theory? Well, we know that there's a commentary by Kama Kancho Shenu, which, as far as I know, is not available. It is listed in some catalog of texts in the, I think, Palpung, no, not Palpung, uh, Drepung uh, monastery but it's not available. Uh, so he was a student of the fourth Kamapa. <clears throat> and then of course there's Gölo Tsaba, whose commentary we have. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely, yes. in my opinion, that is the most unique uh, and most interesting commentary on the Uttara Tantra in the Kaji lineage, if not beyond, because he links the Uttara Tantra to Mahamudra <clears throat> in many ways, mm -hmm. in many general ways and also in specific ways. Uh, and then there's the seventh Kamapa who talks also in the line of the third Kamapa about a more mod moderate Shantong teachings, for example, in his commentary on the, on the Pramana. There are sections where he talks about that. And also in his uh, fragmentary commentary on the Abhisama Alankara, there's also some pieces in there. And then, of course, there's the first and second Kama Trinlipa. Uh, first Kama Trinlipa is a student of seventh Kamapa and follows his view, uh, especially in his commentary on the third Kamapa's profound inner topic, Sabonangden. Talks a lot about Buddha nature there mm. and quotes the seventh Kamapa on that topic also. And then there's the, the second Kamatrinlipa um, who wrote a text um, that actually served as the, the model for German Kongtrul's treasure of knowledge. So it's called the illuminating the intention of the Kamapa. 
So it's like a, you could say it's like a earliest systematic treatise of, you know, kamakaji uh, positions on things, like an encyclopedia kind of thing. Yeah, then there's the eighth kamapa. Mm. Yeah, so when we reach the eighth karmapa, again, we see a major um, sort of um, exponent of Buddha nature theory in the Karma Kaji tradition. And uh, to uh, a lot of people, in, in fact, even to me, he seemed to present a Buddha nature theory that is not fully aligned to the third karmapa's position almost. You know? Like if you read his. Uh, commentary on entering the middle way by Chandrakirti. And Chandrakirti being, a, um, being somebody who expounded emptiness as the ultimate and regarded Buddha nature sutras also as expedient uh, provisional teachings and not to be taken as definitive uh, teachings. Uh, Mikyu Dorje, the eighth Karmapa seemed to sort of uh, take that more strongly in his uh, writings on both Madhyamaka and also the Perfection of Wisdom treatise, Abhisamaya Lankara. Uh, and I've read how you try to bring the two together. And I think the Eid Karmapa himself also has, started, uh, has a, um, sort of reinterpreted the third Karmapa uh, to sort of bring their positions in alignment. But um, do you find any tensions between the two in terms of Buddha nature understanding? I think the Eighth Kamapa's texts, they say sometimes quite different things about Buddha nature. That's what makes it difficult. Also at different periods, like for example, one of his earliest texts was the, the lamp that illuminates or elucidates Shantong, which is basically a commentary on the fourth Vajra point. And also one of his earliest commentaries was the, his commentary on the Abhisamalamkara, which also talks about Buddha nature extensively. And it is said in Pabot Sukla Trangma's history that the early teachers of the Eighth Kamapa told him he should uphold the Shantong view. So these early texts seem to be more along that line. But when you look at the, <clears throat> as you said, when you look at the commentary on the Abhisamayalamkara, he does talk about Buddha nature a lot, also in connection with Mahamudra. But a lot of the way he does is what I call Shantong light which is, so in the Kaji tradition, they have, they call something that they call Salva Shantong and Ying Shantong. So you could say Luminosity Shantong and Expands or Datu Shantong. So he's definitely in that commentary on the, on the Ying Shantong side. So sometimes when he talks about Buddha nature in terms of Shantong, it sounds really more like Rangtong. It's actually very interesting to read and it's, almost like, you know, it's really kind of blowing your mind. But then in other texts later, he says more, you could say, things that are in line with the third Kamapa and more in line with Salva Shantong. Um, but it's scattered throughout his writings. And then, of course, in the end, and his commentary on the uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the Madhyama Kavatara was his latest, his last work. And of course, it's not about Buddha nature. So I think that's the main reason why he doesn't really talk about Buddha nature there. Um, but there's an excellent work by Martina Drastig and David Higgins in the Vienna seri series that's called uh, Buddha Nature Reconsidered. So they basically went to pretty much all of the texts of the Eighth Kamapa and checked out, okay, what does he say about Buddha nature? And it's very interesting because their uh, result is, which I agree with, that the Kamapa's own approach is a middle between the polarized positions of Shantong and Rangtong. Like he tries to harmonize those uh, in a way that, um, combines the virtues of each approach while trying to avoid the pitfalls of each one. So like take the best of each and present that as the highest view 
while making sure that one doesn't fall into the potential pitfalls that each one may have. And also the book contains a very interesting short list of 16 points that summarize the view of the eighth Kamapa on Buddha nature. And then the two volumes, they spell that out. So that's very helpful, actually. And when you look at these 16 points, then you can see that it agrees actually very much with the third Kamapa. But for the details, I refer to that were excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what I found uh, striking in your analysis is um, that you say um, the eight Karmapa um, um, would rather take a sort of a or suggest a stance where we don't look at Buddha nature from the sentient beings perspective, but rather look at Buddha nature from the Buddha's or the Buddha nature's perspective. So in mm -hmm. that respect, sentient beings don't have Buddha nature because sentient beings don't really exist in reality. <laughs> Can you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, to me, that was one of the most kind of shocking, but also illuminating things that I read from him because he puts the whole thing, like he turns it upside down because like we always hear that sentient beings have Buddha mm. nature. And in his commentary on the, on the Samaya Alamkara, he makes a very long argument that sentient beings neither are Buddha nature nor have Buddha nature. So it's like the, the Yerpa and Yenpa thing. So he denies both. And he basically says it's actually the opposite way around it's not that sentient beings have Buddha nature or that Buddha nature exists within sentient beings, but it's more that sentient beings exist within Buddha nature. So, and of course, first one thinks really, mm. but I think it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, you know, if you understand Buddha nature as some little thing that sits somewhere in our body, you know, that's very limited. Mm. But Buddha nature this is like, you know, infinite spaciousness. So how would that ever be possible to be located in a sentient being, which has clear spatial mm -hmm. limitations? So to me, it makes a lot of sense to say, you know, it's like the sentient beings are like, and he uses that example, sentient beings are like clouds in the sky. So it's not that the sky, of course, also exists within the sentient being, but the sky is much bigger than the sentient being. And actually the sentient being is an obscuration of the sky. So once the cloud dissolves, then the sky is clearly present and not obscured. And by the way, that very same statement is actually also made by other people like Long Tenpa, for example, several times in his mm -hmm. text, the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just the Eight Kamapa. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yes. Um, and a lot of these teachings, of course, in the Karmakaji tradition, on Buddha nature is linked to Mahamudra, uh, as in other Kaji traditions. And you have uh, the ultimate continuum, Uttara Tantra, being identified as the text on Mahamudra and particularly Sutra Mahamudra. Um, when, where does this term Sutra Mahamudra sort of originally, initially come from? And how is it explained vis-a-vis -vis the ultimate continuum? It seems that the term itself is really found the first time in Chaming Kong Tool's Treasury of Knowledge. Um, and as I said before, if one would look like thoroughly through that other text I mentioned by the second Kama Trinlipa, one who knows, maybe it's there too, but I haven't done that. Um, but that's what we know. It seems not to be appearing before that. So Chaming Kong Tool makes this division into three types of Mahamudra, Sutra Mahamudra, Tantra Mahamudra, and Essence Mahamudra. And so he explains that quite clearly in the Mahamudra section of the Treasure of Knowledge. And he says, Sutra Mahamudra in essence is Prajnaparamita. The name is Mahamudra and it is in accord with Mantra. So those are the three characteristics. And that is actually that something that's taken more or less from a commentary by Sahajavaja on Maitripa's Tattvadashaka, 
10 stanzas on mm. true reality. So he says the same thing. Like he says, um, he talks, he equates Mahamudra and Prashnaparamita. And then also he talks about uh, this being in accord with mantra, but he does not use the term Sutra Mahamudra as such, but mm. definitely his text is often cited as a source for uh, Sutra Mahamudra because it talks about a path that is not uh, linked to the four empowerments of the Nirutara Tantra Yogas, uh, Nirutara Yoga Tantras, um, but it's outside of that, but it involves some Vajrayana elements. And the key two elements is Guru Yoga, Guru Devotion, and uh, pointing out instructions. But the teachings itself in Sutra Mahamudra are based on the Sudrayana teachings, and that seems also to be what Gampopa then did, depending on the capacities of his students. Well, um, quite a lot to ask you and learn from you uh, also about authors after the eighth Karmapa, but uh, I think um, uh, it's now time to see if the audience have questions and give the audience an opportunity to ask you. So, Let's uh, turn to Marcus. Okay, so yeah, there are a lot of different questions coming in, um, but maybe we could start at the beginning with a sort of overview question. Someone asks about the actual terms for Buddha nature, like the Tagatagarbha and, and what their etymologies are and what it's all about. So maybe we could go back to that and just review briefly um, the terms for Buddha nature. Well, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, if you look at Tathagata Garbha, then there's two parts, Tathagata, and you can take that either to mean thus gone or gone to thusness. And so we all know that's an epithet for the Buddha and Garbha in Sanskrit can both mean womb but also that which is in the womb or like the most holy sanctum of a temple for example so and it's so when you take these two together then the usual understanding is that it means tatagata garba means a lot of people have translated it as actually like womb of the tatagata or embryo of the tatagata or germ of the tatagata something like that but at least in Tibetan tradition, it's very clear that it refers to something that is within sentient beings, like the Buddha within, so to speak. Um, and interestingly, and the Chinese translators seem to have gone the other way. They understand the Garba term more as a kind of an enclosure. And that may be that this accounts for then in Chan tradition and also Zen the position that Buddha nature is everywhere, even in inanimate things. But in Tibetan tradition, it's very clear it's not. And Indian tradition also doesn't say that. Like it's only sentient beings where the Tathagata Garbha is in them. And there are also other terms like Gotra, or Rick lineage uh, gene used, and also Datu that uh, I think um, Carl has shared earlier, um, referring to element or sphere. Right. Um, so there's another question that I think we should get to right away because I know Carl doesn't have a lot of time. He has another event just to do online, I think. Um, but, yeah, but uh, only at seven, so. Okay, good, good, good. So the title you gave for this talk was What is my mind without me? Can you say more about that explicitly? What, what's that about? Yeah, I'm still trying to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Basically, I mean, that's, you know, you could say that's like the Buddha nature koan, right? If you find out what your mind <laughs> is without you, 
that is Buddha nature. But what exactly that feels like, that's, you know, that's the, the research project here. <laughs> mm. And of course, you know, for, for the, the ordinary dualistic mind or the ego mind, it's not even imaginable what our mind would be without us, right? Like it's very difficult because we always consider it as my mind, like that's completely ingrained. So if you just take away the my and just say mind, then there's kind of a big gap there, which is probably good. But I mean, it, it completely dissolves the usual relationship that we have to our mind, which we, I think, mostly consider as some kind of possession or something that we control, all those kinds of things. So if, if all of that falls back, like falls away, like what is mind on its own if we let it be? without ego thoughts and stuff interfering mm -hmm. and is that tied to the Kamapa's idea of, of the, there being no sentient beings <laughs> yes definitely interesting yeah i was actually wondering if you were trying to pass a bigger message through the title to sort of say that Buddha nature is not really a greater self that the, the Buddhists generally deny. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a big point. Yes, definitely. So yeah, Buddha nature is not an upgrade of ego. <laughs> it's actually the ultimate downgrade of ego. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of other more complicated questions coming through here. Um, let's see. Well, one one question is: uh, Can you explain the some sort of relationship between Parinibbana, Trisva Bhava Nirdesha, and Buddha nature? Wow, that sounds like a PhD topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, Vasubandhu in his text, it doesn't, it is not about Buddha nature, right? It's about the three natures. Mm. So he doesn't explicitly talk about that. And of course, the connection between the three natures and Buddha nature is <clears throat> made by other people. And particularly in the Shantong tradition, then, um, there are some Indian precursors who also do that. Interestingly, in some commentaries on the Prajna Paramita Sutras. And there's some debate whether one of these is by Vasubandhu or not, which hasn't been ultimately resolved, uh, where it is said that the Paranishpana is empty of both the Parikalpita and the Paratantra, which is usually not said in, yoga in classical Yogacara texts. Uh, that is said that the Parinishpana, oh, sorry, the Paratantra being empty of the Parikalpita being the Parinishpana. So, but um, the real joining of Yogacara materials, three natures, and Buddha nature teachings, I think, in India only happened pretty, pretty late, like in some of the writings of uh, Ratnakara Shanti. Jnana Sri Mitra and a few others, but the mainstream of that happening in a big way was the Shentong then, starting with Dalpopa. And of course, you could say that the third Kamapa was sort of in that stream too, but he didn't call it Shentong. But he clearly connected Buddha nature and uh, the three natures in his writings. Um. So another person asked, you mentioned Del Popa, so I'll ask this one. Uh, you mentioned Del Popa's response to the idea that samsara and nirvana are differentiated by whether or not you recognize Buddha nature. What was Del Popa's objection to that? Well, he said that's, that, that doesn't fly, that's, that doesn't work, because in his view, 
samsara and nirvana or relative and ultimate truth are completely separate. Like you said, they're like two different kingdoms. They have nothing to do with each other. So, which means um, it doesn't work if you recognize the one to get rid of the other because they're completely disconnected. Something else has to happen. Like you actually have to go from the one to the other, so to speak. Right. And that's quite different from the third Karmapa's presentation of this stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. Like it's it's a question of recognition versus non-recognition. And in Dalpopa, he he doesn't subscribe to mere recognition. Mm. He says there means needs to be more than that. Like that's not what the path consists of. And can I ask, how does someone like Kempo from Gyamsa and Che in modern times teach about that? Well, he definitely also um, taught a lot about recognition and non-recognition. Mm. So he definitely subscribed to that. I never heard him mention that samsara and nirvana or relative and ultimate reality are like two different kingdoms, mm. only when he referred to Dalpopa. And actually, the Uttar Tantra was in his teachings career in the West. That was one of the first texts that he taught, I think, right after the uh, dual ornament, mm. quite extensively, actually. And then, you know, and that most many of those teachings are actually preserved in Rosie Fuchs' book, Buddha Nature, mm -hmm. in the, the notes in the end. So, there he clearly uh, exposes a Shantong view. There's no doubt about that. Right. But a Shantong view that might be slightly different from Do Popa. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Definitely more in line with third Kamapa or eighth Kamapa, as, as we discussed, like a more balanced uh, view. Right. And would you say that's common in the Kagyu tradition? Um, no, not really. Like you could say after Jamming Kongtrul, there was more of a polarization actually, because Jamming Kongtrul, as I said, mainly follows Taranata. Mm. Right. And Jonang presentation of Buddha nature is and Taranata is not exactly the same as Dalpopa either, but still, Jonang's presentation of Buddha nature is very much on the luminosity side and the quality side and all that, and is not favorable of Rangtong in that context. So, and I think mostly after Jamming Kongtrul, that's what people took as the Kachi view. But I think in more modern times that has been, you know, differentiated more by looking again more closely at the text by the Kamapas and things like that. And interestingly, when Jamin Kongtrul comments on the third Kamapas writing, like his treatise on Buddha Nature, mm -hmm. he does not go into any of the things that he says otherwise. He sticks very clearly to what the Kamapa says. Like it doesn't go into, you know, hardcore Shantong presentation of in the Jonang tradition there. So mm -hmm. he definitely seems has seems to have been aware of the difference. Right. Interesting. But then the whole Rangtong Shantong, you know, I mean, there's many debates over many centuries. And then, of course, at some point, it also has become some almost like some corporate identity thing, you know. <laughs> Like, or like, you know, two soccer fan clubs. Well, either you have to belong to this one or to that one. Like, this is so it was sometimes a little bit difficult to find a middle ground there. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, for example, are... also, sorry, just one thing like, for example, also Trunk Rinpoche, he also definitely teaches a um, non exclusivist Shantong view. Right. Mm -hmm. In in Kamakaji, yeah, right, right. 
there's more questions about Shintong, of course, many of them. Um, the one, one is a little bit more specific, but since we're on it, we could ask it for Shintong, for Shintongpa, what is the object of meditation of a Bodhisattva Arya on the uninterrupted path of seeing, I think, is what they mean, and meditation? Hmm. I'm not quite sure what that person is going for, but yeah. Uh, well, Buddha nature. Yeah. There's, there's definitely at that point, there's nothing else. Nothing else but Buddha nature. Yeah. If you're meditating on anything else on the first boomy, then you're not on the first boomy. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so maybe this next part is another part of that question. In terms of a union of emptiness and luminosity, is it that there should be no reification within that luminosity or the realization that the luminosity is empty of inherent existence? Oh, that's bringing it back to the big question, I suppose. Well, I think the big question here is whether those two options, what's the difference? Yeah. Like, what's the difference between not reifying and then not having or lacking real existence or intrinsic existence? That's, I mean, to me, that sounds pretty much the same, unless there's some subtle point I'm missing. But in in the view of the third karma and the so-called non-exclusivist Shantong, they try to combine the Rangtong and Shantong view in that, yes, uh, the nature of the mind is not understood as just plain emptiness because then you have a hard time, what about the qualities, Buddha qualities. But at the same time, if any of these qualities are made into anything, then that's not it. So, but I think one of the big confusions or problems with this whole, this whole debate about Rangtung and Shantung is that when you look at Dolpopa, how he came about, uh, how these terms came about in his writing, he actually was not treating them on the same level of discourse. Which means Rangtong for him is a philosophical system that works with logic and is on the conceptual level. Mm. Whereas Shantong is mostly on the experiential level. Mm. It's not based on reasoning or, you know, nailing things down or something like that. So we're talking about two rather different things. Like one thing is you talk about a philosophically defined, whatever, ultimate nature through inference and reasoning, that's still conceptual. And then you have the experience of what you have been talking about, but that's different. And then it's very hard to talk about the one with the terminology of the other. And I think that's one of the basic problems of this debate. Like, how can you talk about experience through logic? How can you refute experience through logic? It's very difficult. And from the wrong point of view, anything you say about your experience, once you say it, it can be refuted. So, but the actual experience, how are you going to refute that? That's very difficult. But, um, either uh, in Rangtong or in Shentong, I mean, there would be philosophical expositions as well as sort of experiences in their way. So I don't know if this is um, going to be a clarification to that last question, uh, whether that person is uh, actually talking about a slightly more nuanced uh, understanding as in reification applying to all extremes in the Manabika terminology, so not reifying it as emptiness or non-emptiness or existence and non-existence and so forth. And then lack of inherent existence being much more sort of aligned to what the Gelukpa interpretation of emptiness is of only eliminating the uh, intrinsic nature of things and not going beyond existence, non-existence and so forth. So if that were the, the, the purpose, the sort of doubt um, that the uh, person who asked the question has, then I would say that uh, in Rang Jung Doji's case, he argues for non reification in all sense, isn't it? Neither existence nor non existence and so forth. It's not only about eliminating an intrinsic existence, but all extremes or all 
sort of reification and conceptual fabrication. Yes, definitely. And, and I think that that's also, I mean, of course, it's very hard to, you know, assess what the experience of a person is when they talk about these things. Mm, but that's why, <clears throat> at least the non-exclusive mm. with Shantong say that no matter which one of those two paths you're taking, you should arrive at the same result. So, in other mm. words, if you stripping the mind from all reification, you should arrive at the same experience as if you were doing meditation on a more Shantong based presentation, if you understand it correctly, because you cannot arrive to Shantong on a reified idea of Buddha nature or some something like that. If you do, then you have not understood the Shantong presentation. So, but again, there's a lot of debate. Um, but to me, it makes sense if you combine okay? because the the wrong term view definitely is a kind of you know vaccination against thinking in whatever more or less subtle way of Buddha nature as being you know some super self or something or reification, and then the presentations on luminosity and equalities and that it's experiential. <clears throat> That is an antidote against just getting stuck in a conceptual refutational mode. So I think the two do go together if applied properly and skillfully. Do we have more questions, Marcus, or should I? Yeah, ask my... yeah. There are a few more questions, certainly. Um... Let's see, does it seem that the issue of Buddha nature changing or not gets solved by the notion of a gotra which changes and develops so that Buddha nature doesn't have to change? Hmm. That's the whole so, question. <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> the question is about a gotra that's not Buddha nature? I'm not sure. Uh, exactly mm. what they mean there. Yeah, it would mm. have to be somehow different. Yeah, I well, don't know. Perhaps, um, uh, perhaps um, giving different positions on Buddha nature or Gotra uh, being um, permanent or not will help clarify this doubt. You know? Because there are some philosophers who would say Buddha nature is just a seed that changes and can be cultivated, especially among the Gelukpas and the Sakyapas. And then there are others like Rangjung Dorje, Long Chenpa, and Dorpapa who would probably say Buddha nature is fixed eternal entity that needs only revealing and not changes, right? Yeah. Perhaps maybe that sort of explanation is what the person who asked the question wants. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, maybe it comes from the, you know, the, the two main gotras that are presented, which is, you know, the naturally abiding gotra and then the developing or expanding gotra. Mm -hmm. And mm. so the, the, what is called the expanding or developing gotra <clears throat> that seems to change because that's, but from the Buddha nature point of view, then the developing gotra is not really in substance different from the naturally abiding, it's just the process of the naturally abiding gotra being revealed gradually. So which means that there are not really two different ones. It's still the same Buddha nature, but the one is being obscured by mm -hmm. the obscurations. And then when it becomes gradually free of those obscurations, it becomes revealed more and more. But in itself, it, it doesn't change, at least according to Buddha Chandra and definitely the Shantong view. Right. So that doesn't really get around some of the questions from other other Tibetan masters or other lineages that would present it differently. That is to say, presenting those two types of gotra doesn't actually fix the, the philosophical problem. <laughs> No, not, I think not the specific. presentation of uh, 
I mean, in some write, uh, writings of some authors, like Gelsabje, for instance, I think they come up with this hermeneutics of two gotras in order to explain Uttara Tantra um, more conveniently. I mean, there, there's the ultimate gotra, which would be emptiness of inherent existence. And then the conventional gotra, which is really the um, the, in the sort of predisposition to become the Buddha, to seek enlightenment, that sort of, sort of uh, uh, more um, experiential, or more, uh, sort of cognitive mental state. So uh, it looks like <clears throat> the two good words that at least you see in some authors is used mainly as a tool to explain um, the, the presentation of Buddha nature in different uh, sources yeah i think if if you understand the two gotas as you just said then that comes pretty close to what the person was asking because when you take the naturally abiding gotra as emptiness that of course doesn't change but then the the other one that can change Okay, uh, another question is about uh, Kongtro's view, Shentong and the Kagyu lineage. So uh, you mentioned that Zhang Kongtro's view on Buddha nature was influenced by Shentong view, especially by Taranatha. If I understood you right, can you please elaborate a bit more specifically uh, if there's an influence on the current understanding in the Kagyu lineage? Hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people still, if I understand the question correctly, I think a lot of people still in the Kaju tradition are very strongly oriented towards the view of Chaming Kongtrul based on the treasury of knowledge, because that's kind of, you know, like the Kamakaji Bible, so to speak, uh, since it came about. And, um, but it needs to be clear that the uh, treasure of knowledge is really pulling from different sources there's also a lot of shakya choktan in there there's a lot of taranata samdal popa there's of course a lot of nyingma material also in there and when one looks at the whole thing together then it is not necessarily that everything always fits seamlessly together because tom control pulls from different sources that don't necessarily always agree however the mainstream presentation of, I think, Kamakaji of Shantong after him was mainly based on the treasure of knowledge. And I think these days it gets a little bit more differentiated because people look into, you know, the, the uh, texts of major Kamakaji figures before Chaman Kongtru. And for example, also His Holiness uh, Kamapa recently gave a lecture series on uh, supposedly the 30 stanzas of Vasubandhu, but then he went basically uh, the big picture of Yogacara. And also he talked about Shantong and Rangtong and Buddha nature and all those kinds of things. And uh, yeah, so that was a very interesting uh, presentation that was more based on like that come up, uh, it come up uh, and others in that regard and by the way he said pretty clearly that the third combo is a shantung mm. so you know and if anybody he should know <laughs> there you go <laughs> <laughs> okay. well karma would you like to uh, perhaps wrap mm. up the session Yes, indeed. It's uh, already one hour and 17 minutes. Um, yeah, so oh, there's a lot more to ask. I actually wanted to ask about uh, the role of Yogacara in the Karmakaji teachings and also a few other things, but maybe wrap up uh, by asking you this question, which is more personal. Um, so obviously, Buddha nature study and practice must be shaping your own outlook and understanding of life. Um, what can others, especially people coming from the similar background as yours, learn from it? And what can they do to sort of um, 
uh, get more inspiration or uh, get influence from the, the nature teachings? Yeah, I think um, for me, Buddha nature teachings are, you know, the best antidepressant. Like, even if you have a really bad day, then, you know, your Buddha nature is still fun, doing fine. And I think the more we can get that into our head and our heart and our mind, that alone, I think, makes a big, big difference. Because then whatever goes on in our mind, in our world, you know, however troublesome it may seem, <clears throat> there's still that place one can come back to as, you know, however you want to call it, the, the true home of the mind. And so I think that is something extremely valuable. And that's something that nobody can take away. And it's really a matter of reminding ourselves as much as we can and then try to give it a chance and connect. Like they say, you know, give Buddha nature a chance. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> well, yes, let's hope um, people around the world will give Buddha nature a chance. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful, uh, concise final message. Um, so with that, uh, thank you everyone joining us from around the world and uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Carl, for your you. wisdom, for getting your knowledge. Thank you. And thank you, Marcus. Thanks. Yes, thank Thanks you all everybody. so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.